In our last two lectures, we have defined the trickster as a mythological character, and we've discussed some of the ways that scholars have attempted to explain his rather unusual combination of qualities. And we also looked at five examples. Uh, we looked from the Winnebago cycle in North America. We looked at Hermes from Greece, Enki from Sumer, Loki from Norse mythology, and Maui from Oceania. This time, we want to take a closer look at some Native American tricksters. We want to look at some of their embodiments, look at the character of the North American uh, Native American trickster, look at a few trickster stories, and then perhaps make a few suggestions about the function of the Native American trickster in their mythology. As we've noticed, old world tricksters tend to be human-like in shape. They may be gods or they may be giants, but in shape they are much like ours. In most Native American myths, the trickster appears as an animal, or at least with an animal name. He can shift back and forth at will. Sometimes in a myth, it's really hard to tell whether he's at the moment, whether he's an animal or human. And oftentimes, it seems not to matter. If we think about ourselves hearing these stories in the oral tradition, hearing them, we can hear the stories and think about this creature, whichever way we want to think of him, and without any problem. On the North Coast, or the North Pacific Coast, he tends to be raven. And then further south, he might be mink or blue jay. On the plains, the plateau, and parts of California, he's coyote. In the southeast, he's rabbit or hare. And in the central woodlands, he's bambozo, usually thought of as a spider. He has lots of other names. Uh, for the Iroquois, he's flint or sapling. In the northeast, Algonquins, uh, he's gloose cap or nana bush. As to why the animal associations should be so much stronger among Native Americans, as, and as we'll see, Africans too, uh, than they are in the Old World, um, has been suggested is the result of the kind of closer connectedness or relatedness that these cultures feel between humans and nature, especially between humans and animals. Um, Carl Krober, in his book, Artistry in Native American Myths, says this about this aspect of the Native American trickster. Trickster embodies the openness that exists at the heart of the Indian refusal to distinguish, as the Western Judeo-Christian tradition so insistently does, between natural and supernatural. The Indian is free to perceive every creature as existing in a condition of wonderful ambiguity, contributing to a wondrous, everlastingly ongoing vitality in its most natural, hence sometimes scandalous, behavior. Trickster, therefore, enables us to recognize the absurdity, the dangerousness, even the vileness of natural behavior without sacrificing any appreciation for the goodness of natural life. What he's saying here is that the, these cultures allow themselves to look straight at nature, to look at it directly without idealizing it, without simplifying it, without deleting and picking and choosing, and at the same time being able to endorse those parts of nature that, that might offend us in some manner, at the same time to endorse also the goodness of natural life. And perhaps this is what allows their tricksters to be so much more closely associated with animals than they are in the old world. The creatures chosen as tricksters are, are chosen carefully um, based on close observation. Uh, way back in lecture three, we talked about how carefully the Egyptians had observed their animals when they were making those god combinations of half human and half animal. Well, Native Americans have, have observed and chosen just as carefully in deciding which creatures become, um, become tricksters. Um, there's an essay by Michael Carroll called The Trickster as Selfish Buffoon and Culture Hero in which he says that the first thing to notice about all of these creatures chosen as tricksters in Native American mythology tend to be loners or at most they live in pairs rather than more in more gregarious groupings. Crows are gregarious, ravens aren't. Rabbits are gregarious, but hares aren't. Wolves are gregarious, but coyotes aren't. The, the loneliest of all of these trickster creatures is probably the spider. In most species, the spider spends only two brief times with other spiders in its whole lifetime, once at birth and once when mating. So these are, all the animals chosen are, are solitary. They work outside of groups. Each one also has a special attribute or skill which helps in the trickster role. 
Spiders, for example, are mysterious. They can spin webs out of their own bodies and makes them seem like magic. Ravens are considered by ornithologists to be among the smartest of all birds. They also seem even to have senses of humor and mischief. Much of what they do, like their aerial acrobatics or rolling down snow-covered hills, seems to be done not for any practical reason but just for the fun of it. They work closely with wolves, but they also seem to be able to tease them and play tricks on them, and they've been caught seeming to laugh at them. Coyotes are the most talented of all trickster figures. They've been hunted and poisoned and trapped, and the result is that they're now in all 50 states except Hawaii, and don't bet against them showing up there someday. I had a colleague at my college um, who was part of his PhD thesis was supposed to do a population count of a ground squirrel colony. And the way he'd gone about doing this was he would set live traps and then count the number of, of ground squirrels he caught and then release them and then catch them, set the traps again, catch them the next day. And through some really complicated mathematical formula, he was supposed to eventually be able to figure out about how many ground squirrels lived in this colony. But what happened almost immediately as he started setting his live traps is the fact that they would, every day when he would come to check them, they would be opened and the ground squirrels eaten. And he came very quickly to understand it was coyotes that were doing this because he said after a while they would come and watch him set the traps. They were on a little ridge where they could watch him as he said they were sitting there watching him make their lunch for them. And so he tried everything he could think of to make his traps coyote proof. And finally, as a last resort, he drove stakes down in the four corners, buried, the, buried those stakes so deep they didn't think the coyotes would be able to get at them. But sure enough, they learned how to dig up the stakes, tip the trap over, open it, eat the ground squirrel. And he said he finally gave up on that project altogether when one day he, he found that one of his traps had been dug up, it had been tipped over, it had been opened, the ground squirrel eaten, eaten and there was coyote poop on top of the trap. This, that story sounds almost too good to be true. But it's the, the people who work with coyotes are, um, have a lot of stories like this. E even coyote traps, traps that are set to catch coyotes, get sprung, the bait gets eaten, and tipped upside down, and then the coyote, as a last gesture of contempt, will pee on the trap. Um, Lewis Hyde says, this, in the fact that while wolves were being hunted to extinction and then needed to be protected and reintroduced into their environment, Coyotes took care of themselves, and they now feast on purebred poodles in Beverly Hills. Spiders feature very largely in African trickster myths, and we'll spend more time with them in our next lecture, but we need to at least include one Native American spider story. This one comes from Richard Eros and, R Erdos and Alfonso Ortiz in a collection of American Indian trickster tales. This one, this particular spider story comes from uh, the Lakota and Dakota peoples who are parts of the Sioux Nation. Uh, he's described, um, Spider is described as sometimes wise, sometimes a fool. He's responsible for the creation of time and space. He invented language. He gave all the animals names. Um, he may be descended from the God of Wisdom, and he used to sit with the high gods, but he's banished for some misconduct to Earth, and the only weapon he was allowed to bring with him was his cunning which at least half the time gets him caught up in his own cleverness. Like other tricksters, he's always thinking about sex. He imagines himself to be a great lover, although not all of his partners would agree. Um, he can transform himself into a beautiful youth to seduce maidens and wives. He has a love potion that makes him irresistible to women, and he plays a flute beautifully, luring women to him with his beautiful music, the way Krishna did, uh, as we learned earlier. He sleeps both with human and animal females, and he violates all kinds of serious taboos by sleeping with his own daughters. He is something of a sexual athlete. Uh, like the Winnebago trickster, he carries his oversized penis in a box, which he can make, and he can make it bigger or smaller as he needs to. And like the Winnebago trickster, he can send it across the river to impregnate a woman on the far shore. He's married, but that doesn't cramp his style very much, but sometimes, in one of those trickster stories where he gets caught and in his own trap, um, his wife sometimes gets her revenges. The Brule Sioux have a story about Iktomi, who's the spider, uh, making arrangements to, to sneak into a young woman's teepee at night after dark and to sleep with her. 
His wife finds out about the arrangements, and she then makes arrangements to exchange places with the young girl. So when Iktomi goes into the teepee, he's really going to be making love to his own wife, not to the young girl. While he's making love, Iktomi regales what he thinks is the young woman with stories about how much better and fresher and firmer and more responsive and in every way she is than the sort of dried up, naggy old woman that he lives with and he has to sleep with all the rest of the time. In the morning, when he's sneaked back into his own teepee and he comes, shows up for breakfast, his wife starts whacking him with her turnip digger, reminding him of all the nasty things that he said about her the night before. He eventually has to make a run for it, um, but um, he gets hungry after a while, and so eventually he w needs to come back. When he comes back, he says, old woman, you're still the prettiest. Be peaceful. Didn't I give you a good time last night? What's for breakfast? A lot of, like a lot of trickster stories, uh, this one can be told surely for the fun of it. Uh, humor is an important part of trickster stories, and as, um, as Erdos and, and Ortiz point out, they quote uh, a, Sioux in, a medicine man named Lame Deer who says that humor has been always very important for Native Americans. This is what Lame Deer says. Coyote, Iktomi, and all clowns are sacred. They are a necessary part of us. A people who have, who have so much to cry about as Indians do also need their laughter to survive. Tricksters, as we've seen, um, violate a lot of taboos. Um, and scholars have tried to explain this strange combination of culture hero and violator of the most sacred rules. Some years back, there was a brilliant essay that was written by Laura Macarius. It was called The Myth of the Trickster, colon, The Necessary Breaker of Taboos. And she says, argues in this essay, that the two sides, taboo breaker and culture hero, are intimately related since the trickster's power comes precisely from breaking taboos. As she points out, among many peoples, blood taboos are the most important. It's why menstruating women and women giving birth were always separated from the community. It's why incest or killing a relative, which brings one into contact with consanguineous blood, is the most dangerous kind of all. Why there are such fundamental crimes. The reason why these are taboo is that the violation of a taboo releases a terrible power, which can be both positive and negative. Releases that power on the breaker of the taboo so that he or she has to be separated from the community in order to protect others from that power. There are people, and she reminds us of stories of this happening, there were peoples who in times of great need deliberately break taboos in order to get at that power. Sometimes in a famine, a hunter would deliberately commit incest to try to appropriate that power for the hunt. Or sometimes an apprentice had to kill a blood relative to become a full shaman. Among the Navajo, we remember this from, uh, from an earlier lecture, from Lecture 6, um, incest and shamanism are, still, are very closely related. Shamans had to you know, do much good for the community, but the power they acquire is dangerous too. And so they are feared and they spend a lot of their time as loners. In the Navajo emergence myth, we looked back, at, at back in Unit 1, the story ends with the first man and first woman being sent to the eastern mountains to be educated. When they returned, we're told, they sometimes wore masks, and when they wore them, they prayed for rain and crops. But, the story says, in those eastern mountains, these people learn terrible secrets, too. For witches also wear masks like these, and they, too, marry their close relatives. As Macarius points out, the trickster figure becomes a culture hero and acquires the power to do so by violating taboos. His stories are always full of rebellion and transgression and sacrilege, but the power he wins from doing these things is the power that he then uses to transform the world. A people who wants access to that power, the power of broken taboos, but who also need to respect the taboos themselves, will tell stories about heroes who break the rules for them and gain access to that power and then when the punishments come, the punishments are always delivered on the violators themselves, not on the rest of the people, because they're separated out from the people. It's no wonder they're heroes. They are people who break taboos for us and bring that power to bear in our lives. Macarius illustrates um, her general thesis with a myth about, of the Algonquin, about the trickster Manabozo, 
whose violations of blood taboos are many. His birth is messy, it's posthumous, and it's very weird. He commits incest with a sister and perhaps with a grandmother, and he goes into a menstrual tent to choose his wife, a very, very big taboo. In each case, every violation, however, leads to a run of good luck. After choosing his wife in the menstrual tent, he becomes a fabulous hunter because the power of that blood has been released to him. In the course of his career, he brings many new medicines to his people. He becomes the founder of their ceremonial life and in all ways a great culture hero. In some versions of his myth, he is also the one who introduces death into the world, as do many other tricksters. Macaria says, in fact, that the dangerous power of blood can't ever be separated from death, and it's one reason why tricksters are never immortal. Death is both the limit of power and the consequence of it, as it was with Maui in Lecture 29, who's finally defeated by his grandmother, the goddess of death and the underworld. That, Macaria says, it's, is why the trickster is made up of such an odd combination of traits, because it is precisely breaking taboos that gives him the power to become a culture hero. There's another interesting explanation for the character of the trickster among Native Americans, and that is that he's descended from the shaman. The shaman was, and still is in some places, a powerful medicine man or woman whose importance in the old world was greatest in Siberia and Central Asia, the places from which the indigenous Native Americans came. According to Mircea Eliad, in a book called Shamanism, shamanism involves a calling, a vocation, in which one must in some sense die, be visited by spirits, and then be reborn. Shamans go into trances in which their spirits travel to the spirit world, either in the sky or underworld, where then he or she gains knowledge and power from the spirits. In hunting societies, he or she may learn the language of animals. Returned from travels, the shaman has the gifts of precognition and clairvoyance and can sometimes control weather and people's supply of game. He can also cure illness. Sometimes the cure involves traveling to a spirit world to recapture a patient's soul and to bring it back. But because of that power, shamans can also cause illness or even death. A shaman's costume is usually that of an animal, most frequently that of a bird, and of the birds, most frequently an eagle or a raven. It turns out there are so many striking similarities between the trickster and the shaman that some have been led to assert that the trickster is a descendant of the shaman. Since the trickster is in some ways godlike, responsible for parts of creation, it may be that one of the earliest conceptions of God was that of a shaman metamorphosed into a trickster. We remember from Lecture 17 that cave painting at La Trois Frères in France, which has been identified by some as a painting of a shaman. And we remember from that same lecture the Cherokee story of the bear man that can be thought of as a shamanistic initiation story. So another hypothesis about this odd combination of elements in a trickster is that as people moved into agricultural communities, hunting became less necessary for survival and so the shaman became less important and mythically he was downgraded to become a player of tricks, a kind of endearing troublemaker. He's still not entirely forgotten and the shaman has survived in rituals and ceremonies. He survives in the kachinas of the Hopi or the Zuni or the Pueblo where he's still involved in bringing rain to assure good crops. Uh, we remember in fact that one of the original functions of the shaman was controlling the weather. The point is that the trickster may be one of our oldest conceptions of God, and it's why David Leeming and Jake Page in their book God, Myths of the Male Divine, start their biography of God with a chapter on shamans and the trickster whose relations may go back to where the shaman's role as animal master may have contributed to trickster's embodiment as an animal and to his unusual combination of characteristics. Well, enough by way of theory. Let's do some stories. The, uh, Two of the most important embodiments in, uh, of the trickster in North America are raven and coyote. The raven is a trickster mostly for northern peoples, both in North America and the parts of Asia from which the indigenous Americans emigrated. Scholars have thought that it's easier to think of ravens as tricksters in places that don't depend on agriculture for survival, since for agricultural peoples the raven can be a pest. 
in parts of North America where the raven became a trickster and culture hero, they include the eastern edges of Alaska and Canada and down the U.S. coast as far as California. In all of those places, agriculture wasn't very important, and therefore the playful qualities of a raven could be appreciated more than in places where people had to try to keep them out of fields. The raven as a trickster is part of the mythology of many Pacific Northwest peoples, from the Inuit in the far north to the peoples of Northern California. For all of them, he's a culture hero. In many versions of the story, he is sent to a world which has been virtually destroyed by a great flood, and he takes all of the elements already existing and, and combines them into the world that we still live in. He's not omniscient or omnipotent, and he's very much the trickster oftentimes falling into his own traps, making bad choices, and getting humiliated. But he also in the stories creates the first fish hook, teaches the spider how to make webs, teaches humans how to make fish nets. He places fish in the rivers, plants fruits all over the land, but in the process he also makes it necessary for humans to work for everything they get. After Raven, nothing comes for nothing. One of the most famous raven stories of all comes, uh, involves the stealing of light, the lights that illuminate the earth by day and by night. In this story, raven comes to a world that's already created, and he's, but it's a world that's already dark. Uh, someone, either the creator god or some very powerful other being, has control of the light, which he keeps in a box on, on the, hanging on his wall. Raven is sent to this dark earth to distribute fruit and fish, but it's difficult to do in the dark. He, he can't find his way around. It's even difficult to feed himself. Everything is so dark that just moving from one place to another is a, is a great difficulty. So what Raven eventually does is he, he discovers that that box with the light hanging in it that's been captured by someone is in a different sphere, perhaps the heavens, but somewhere else other than earth. What he does is he keeps searching until he finds an opening into that sphere and then he flies through it. Then he has to figure out how to get into the house, which seems impervious, locked on all sides. There's no way he can get into the house to get at that ball of light. But each day he notices the man's daughter goes down to the river to get water and so he decides to use her to get into the house. So one day when she goes to get water, Raven changes himself into either a speck of dirt or a hemlock needle or a leaf from a cedar tree and he floats on the water that she's collecting. When she drinks it, he enters her and she becomes pregnant. After he's born, he becomes the apple of his grandfather's eye and he's inside the house now. Each day, now that he's in the house, as a little baby, he cries and cries and cries until his grandmother, grandfather figures out that what he wants is he wants to play with that box hanging on the wall. Eventually, the grandfather, as grandfathers do, he gives in. He gives the baby the box, and, and the baby takes out the shiny ball inside. This goes on for a long time, till ev every day, so that everyone assumes the baby always plays with a shining ball, and no one pays much attention to it anymore. Then one day... The baby seizes the ball, turns into a raven, flies out through the smoke hole, in some versions turning black in the process. He was presumably white before then, and then takes off with the ball of light. There are all kinds of versions of what happens next, but on, in one of them, and he, he drops the ball and it breaks, and then he releases the sun into the sky. In some version, when he, versions, when he drops the ball, it shatters, making the stars and moon in others, he's already released those lights while he's still living in his grandfather's house. And in some versions, um, people who can't stand this new light, they've gotten so used to living in the dark, that they have to be turned into fish or animals that avoid the sun. And then they have to be put aside because they can't stand this new light. But in all of the versions, the world is lighted by day and by night, and Raven is the one who made it so. Lewis Hyde says that in this story, Raven does what tricksters always do. He finds holes in the boundaries between things, and then he slips through them. Here he finds several. He, he finds the hole dividing the earth from the sky to find the old man's house. Then he finds a gap in the old man's daughter to breach another line of defense. And then he slips through the gap in the old man's vigilance by crying. No one is able to resist a crying, unhappy child. As Hyde points out, had he offered to fight the old man, the outcome would have been uncertain. Instead, he uses a trickster's techniques. He is welcomed, cared for, and then given the prize that he seeks. 
This is what tricksters do. They always keep a sharp eye out for opportunities and seize them. And when they aren't there, they sometimes create them uh, just to make things happen the way they happen. There are a lot of other raven stories for you to discover. Uh, in a similar one, he steals water from an old man who'd been hoarding all of the water. He tricks the old man into leaving the house. And then he takes all the water into his beak and he flies off along the way, creating streams and rivers for people who live there. We looked at that part of that myth in lecture one. Coyote is the trickster of the Southwest, the plains and the plateau, and like other tricksters, and he's like other tricksters. Um, as as um, Erdos and Ortiz in their book on American Indian trickster tales say, that the coyote in Native American myths is always part human and part animal. He takes whatever shape pleases him. On the one hand, he's a godlike creator, the bringer of light, a monster killer. On the other hand, he's a thief, a cheat, and a lecher. As a culture hero, he makes the earth, he makes animals, he makes humans. Like Prometheus, he brings fire to people, and he positions the sun, moon, and stars in their places and teaches humans how to live. But on the other hand, as a trickster, he's greedy, he's gluttonous, and a deceiver. Sometimes he teams up with other animals, like fox or badger or rabbit. Sometimes he competes with them for food and women. Sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses. William Bright, in a, in a really nice collection of coyote stories called A Coyote Reader, says that coyote, as a culture hero, brings, steals fire, brings salmon for human use, lays down cultural rules for men and women. He even ordains death. But at the same time, he's grossly erotic, insatiably hungry, vain, deceitful, always acting not from altruism or malice, but from his own impulses or appetite, or for the sheer joy of playing tricks. There are lots and lots of good coyote stories, including one about the uh, old man coyote and old woman coyote meeting for the first time to discover they're identical, except for what they carry in their little bags. His has a penis in it, hers has a vulva. They discuss what to do with them, where to put them, and in the process they create both sex roles and procreation for humans. I want to, tell you, want to end by telling you two st coyote stories. Uh, the first one is from the Navajo. Um, and this one, is, this one is one of those stories about Coyote, both as trickster and culture hero. Uh, first, uh, man has placed all of the stars in the, that are going to go into the sky on, a, on the desert floor. On another part of the desert floor, he's drawn this very elaborate map about where he wants to put the stars. And so he picks up one star at a time and places it very carefully in the sky. What his intention is, is he wants to make so many patterns in the sky that people will be able to use those patterns for travel, for telling the seasons, for telling the time of day, and he wants to make these, this very elaborate design in the sky. Coyote watches this for a while and he gets bored. He says, this is taking such a long time. So what he does is he takes all the stars that are still laying on the desert floor and he just throws them up into the sky, giving them a breath of air for good measure. The constellations that the first man had already put into the sky stayed in place, but all the rest of them, the random order that the rest of the stars are in now, that was all the doing of Coyote. The other Coyote story is from the Caddo people who uh, originally lived as agricultural people in what's now Oklahoma. At, at, in this story, people are still immortal at the beginning of this myth, but they're troubled by the beginnings of overpopulation. That is, they're getting to be more and more people since no one ever dies and the food supply is looking endangered. At a council, one chief suggests death as a solution. But they all say, no, no, no. No one wants his friends or relatives to go away forever. So the decision is finally made a kind of compromise reached in which people will die and be gone for a while and then they'll come back. Coyote objects. He says this wouldn't solve any problem because um, if people continue to come back, population is going to continue to grow. But he's outvoted, since no one wants death to be forever. So when the first person dies, he's placed in a grass house that's built by medicine men with a door facing east. The people then will sing songs calling the spirit of the dead person back to the house, and when the spirit arrives, the dead will be restored to life. After ten days of singing, a whirlwind begins to blow from the west and begins to circle a house. Coyote sees it and he closes the door before the wind can enter. Whirlwind, finding the door closed, keeps on moving. And since then, the people say, death is forever. And people also say that whenever they see a whirlwind, some spirit is wandering about, which spirits tend to do until they find the path into the spirit land. 
And also, they say, ever since Coyote has been on the move, looking over both shoulders to see if anyone is following him, and he's always starving since no one will give him any food. Here, Coyote is both culture hero introducing death into the world and a trickster who gets tripped up by his own cunning. In trying to guarantee the food supply, he winds up being hungry forever. Well, that's a quick look at uh, some Native American tricksters who stay pretty much true to form for all tricksters. In the next two lectures, we'll take a look at some African tricksters. Uh, next time, those who are like Native American ones who are associated with animals. And after that, a couple of very important African tricksters whose human shape connects them more with tricksters of the old world than with the new. That's our next two lectures.